Good evening and welcome uh, to our educational symposium this evening, The Present and Future of Cancer Immunotherapy Biomarkers, Challenges, Opportunities, and Implications for Pathologists. The speakers today are shown here. Um, I'm uh, Dr. David Rim. I'm a professor of pathology at Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, joining me is Dr. Louis Diaz, who's the head of solid tumor oncology from Memorial Sloan Kettering Institute in New York City. And then uh, Dr. Lynette Scholl, an associate professor of pathology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School in Boston. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled The Present and the Future of Cancer Immunotherapy Biomarkers, Challenges, Opportunities, and Implications for Pathologists. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash hgj. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thanks so much, David, and thanks for the opportunity to present some of the data that's been emerging over the past really five years on immunotherapy in solid tumor oncology. Uh, I'm going to use a few examples of where the data is most exciting, um, although it's exciting in many different arenas. So it all begins with the story of immune suppression. Tumors have developed a way to avoid the immune system. And there are a variety of different mechanisms of immune suppression, but immune checkpoints have emerged to the top as one of the most druggable uh, and reversible ways of immune suppression. And the first really to come into the landscape was ipilimumab, which blocks CTLA-4 and reverses that immune suppression pathway. And we saw the most exciting data, the most striking data, actually in melanoma. Um, and this is a pooled analysis, uh, a phase two and phase three data, where we're actually seeing very long-term survivor survivals and potentially even what we may call cure. How we define cure is still evolving, especially in the age of immunotherapy. In the age of chemotherapy and targeted therapy, we said it was five years, um, but we're seeing recurrences beyond five years in many diseases. How we define cure is a moving target, but I'm hopeful that we'll have a definition in the near future. There are some medical oncologists in the audience, I'd be curious on their opinion of that definition as well. But as the science evolved, on the heels of CTLA-4 blockade, was blockade of, an, of another checkpoint access. And that was blockade of PD-1 and its ligands PD-L1 and PD-L2. And what this did was release the brakes. So then if we use melanoma as another example, here's melanoma circa 2001. Melanoma during the IPI or CTLA-4 blockade era and now more recently, melanoma in the PD-1 blockade area. So we're seeing not only an evolution in our understanding of how tumors suppress the immune system, but that blocking these checkpoint inhibitors, first with CTLA-4 was quite effective, and now more recently, blocking with anti-PD-1 seems to be even more effective. I'm gonna walk you through three scenarios, actually four scenarios, where PD-1 blockade the new kid on the block is really making a lot of movement. And this is in second line lung cancer. And when you bring a new drug into the therapeutic arena, you look for the biggest impact, but you work on areas where the treatment is refractory or the current standard of care is not working. And so this is an overview of Checkmate 17 and Checkmate 57. And what these studies showed was second line lung cancer, stages three, B and four that are squamous or non-squamous treated with anti-PD-1, in this case it was Nevo, um, at three milligrams per kilogram versus the standard of care second line therapy with a Taxol. This is Taxotere. And what was clear in both studies was that that PD-1 blockade was superior. And this is overall survival showing a survival of six months versus 9.2 months. And Checkmate 17, this was in the squamous cell, and in the non-squamous cell, again, you see a survival benefit there of 9.4 months versus 12.2 months. This was also shown to be true uh, with pembrolizumab. And here they showed two different doses of anti-PD-1 at two milligrams per kilogram 
uh, versus 10 milligrams per kilogram versus the standard of care. And the results are just as striking. You see an overall benefit for the PD-1 blockade arms uh, superior over chemotherapy. One thing to note here is that we are also looking at patients that were exceptional expressors of PDL1. But just to show you, these are cases where over 50% of the tumor cells there were staining positive for PDL1. And this is the third agent, and again, versus standard of care, a very positive result. And so what we have here is a variety of different studies with three different PDL. PD-1 and PD-L1 blocking agents that all, all had similar effects in the second line. They had benefit in overall survival versus standard of care chemotherapy. And there was a hint that the biomarker may be beneficial as a marker to <clears throat> really highlight those cases that were preferentially beneficial to PD-1 blockade. But in most cases, PD-L1 or PD-1 blockade is the option of choice irrespective of PD-1, PD-L1 expression. And so there were a number of breakthroughs, uh, statuses, approvals with Nevo, Pembro, and atezolizumab um, in this indication, so second-line lung cancer. <clears throat> in development, again, we moved from second-line lung cancer, which was a, a, an area of unmet need, but now moving into the first-line lung cancer, looking at PD-1 blockade versus standard of care chemotherapy in patients with non-small cell lung cancer, um, with again a high PDL1 expression. And we saw a profound impact in terms of progression free survival and a profound impact in terms of overall survival as well. And this was of FDA approval for first line Pembro in non small cell lung cancer. Nevo had a similar study, Nevo in PDL1 expressors that are greater than 1%, so a different cutoff than what the Pembro study had versus standard care chemotherapy. The difference here was not significant. What about in earlier stage cancers? So those two other arenas were in metastatic cancers that were non-resectable. These are in stage three locally advanced cancers that are traditionally treated with chemotherapy and radiation. And so these were locally advanced non-small cell lung cancers. This is called the Pacific Study, and this was very creative. They took patients with locally advanced lung cancer, gave them the standard of care therapy, and then randomized them to pd one blockade versus standard of care observation. And what they found was a dramatic difference. So when you added pd one blockade after the standard of care chemo radiation, you had a dramatic difference, and here is progression-free survival, and we'll soon have readouts on overall survival. Interestingly, there appears to be no impact on pd one expression, but that remains to be seen once it hits overall uh, survival data. So PD-1L1 is a biomarker. <clears throat> in the first line, it's clear that it's an important biomarker, but a high number of tumor cells have to be expressing the PD-L1 molecule. What about melanoma? Well, when we're starting to look at responses in melanoma, because it was the earliest uh, tumor treated, we're starting to see really what, how these checkpoint inhibitors are and working. I showed you um, this slide earlier. This is patients treated with uh, IPI alone. Uh, this is NEVO at one dose, and this is NEVO at a second dose. So we're seeing uh, improvement in overall survival, um, even in these pooled analyses when you're comparing CTLA-4 versus PD-1 blockade. But the next question that is the next evolution of immunotherapy is, okay, so we have CTLA-4 blockade, we have PD-1 blockade, what if we combine them? And what we're seeing is, is that we are seeing a difference in overall survival when you combine them. However, it's not significant in all settings. The problem is we're also seeing a significant amount of toxicity. So improving on the response rate, improving on the progression-free survival, and eventually improving on the overall survival will be there, but you are going to see an increase in toxicity. And some of these toxicities can be life-threatening, and the majority of these are autoimmune, and oftentimes, the patients don't do well on, uh, on re-challenge to therapy. And this is PFS in that same population. What about PD-L1 expression? Less important than the lung cancer. So the next area I'm gonna talk about is completely different. Mismatch repair deficient tumors or MSI high tumors. And the theory around this came about the time where we were seeing responses in melanoma and in lung cancer 
And the hypothesis was that these tumors are the high mutational burden, melanoma lung cancers, compared to pediatric tumors, liquid tumors, sporadic adult tumors, may be driving the immune response. And what would be the best test case to prove that hypothesis? And that was mismatch pair deficient tumors that didn't have a few hundred mutations per genome, but rather had thousands of mutations per genome. And that's different from non-mismatch pair deficient tumors, or MSI, or MSS tumors, that were microsatellite stable, which had fewer mutations, about 70 mutations per genome, versus the MSI high tumors with thousands of mutations. And so the theory was that these mutations that accumulated with each cellular division that couldn't be repaired because of mismatch repair deficiency, these mutations, if expressed and translated into a protein, could create a neoantigen that appeared foreign to the host immune system. And these mutations could take a variety of different forms and could sit in the MHC class one or two cleft and drive a T cell response. So in order to test the hypothesis, um, we designed this study actually. This was a colorectal cancer study where we looked at mismatch repair deficient colon cancers versus those that are proficient. So our MSI high versus MSI, MSS tumors, high mutational burden versus low mutational burden, and then looked at a variety of other non-colon cancers that were also MSI high. These were all treatment refractory, and they were all treated with single agent anti-PD-1. So this is a classic example of a patient with a large tumor here, peri periaortic, with a great response rate. And here you can see the biomarker uh, had a great response there. So when you look at the study summary, um, the response rate was about 60% in the MSI high tumors and 0% in the microcellulite stable tumors. Disease control rate, so stable disease, partial response, or complete response, was about 90% in the mismatch repair deficient tumors um, and about 16% in the proficient tumors. Progression-free survival and overall survival were not reached for the deficient tumors, um, but very easily reached in the uh, proficient tumors. So this study was the basis for the FDA breakthrough approval for MSI high colorectal cancer. And there was a second study uh, out of MD Anderson that was recently uh, published as well that granted NEVO approval for colorectal cancer. And in terms of single agent anti-PD-1, it's clearly active in colorectal cancer with durable responses beyond, beyond two years. We have several patients that are disease free, uh, and these were previously patients who were metastatic, unresectable, non-responsive to chemotherapy, and a handful who were already in hospice when we started treating them. Uh, Nevo and Pembro have been FDA approved for treatment refractory uh, MSI high metastatic colon cancer, and the NCCN guidelines reflect this. Um, and registration studies in the first line are ongoing. But what happened after we had this breakthrough status is that we continued to collect patients, but not just with colon cancer, but also with MSI high tumors from anywhere else in the body, from the brain, from the lung, breast, pancreas, uh, liver, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, endometrial tumors. And what we were seeing was that we had a similar response rate, a similar PFS, and a similar OS in that population of patients. So the conversation evolved from let's get full approval in colon cancer because it's easy to can we get approval in a tumor agnostic fashion? So we don't care where the tumor was born, we just care about the genetics of the tumor. Testing for MSI or mismatch repair deficiency had been established for years. And um, this, along with two other studies that were ongoing, were used as a package to present to the FDA for this case. And here's just uh, a slide that shows the frequency in our study of, um, of MSI high tumors that were treated. The majority were colorectal, but we had a variety of other tumor types. Probably the most impressive in our groups were uh, the patients with endometrial cancer, who all virtually had a complete response, and also the pancreatic cancer patients that were really in dire straits when they were enrolled in our study, uh, and those patients continued to do quite well. The duration of overall response is fantastic. 
And in May earlier this year, the FDA granted accelerated approval to Pembro in a tissue and site agnostic uh, manner. And independently, this was the fascinating part that it was in adults and children. So not only was in every tumor type for treatment refractory disease, but also in adult and children. So the impact of the discovery in this application, uh, we believe it's about 4% of all cancers. Um, in the US, it's about 40,000 total new cases, about 24,000 stage four cases, and about a half a million stage four cases globally. Um, in terms of pd one PDL1 expression, it's there. It's very hot at the invasive front. Um, it's not there uh, in tumors that are mismatch repair proficient. Um, and the first row shows colon cancer. Uh, the last row shows an endometrial cancer. This is just a graph that shows that there, there's enrichment for CD8 cells and PDL1 expression at that invasive front. Um, and this is an interesting example. So this is a uh, multi-spectra IHC. And in the red, we've circled tumor. And in the blue, we're circling an invasive front. Uh, this is cytokeratin stain that's very rich in the tumor, but virtually absent from the invasive front. This is CD3 cells. They're all at the invasive front. CD8 cells, all at the invasive front, not within the tumor. Uh, CD68 cells, myeloid cells, again at the invasive front. And PDL1 combined with PAN-CK, absent from the tumor, but present on CD68 cells in the invasive front and on CD3 positive cells at the invasive front. So telling us a little bit where the action is happening and where PDL1 may be important from a, uh, from a functional standpoint. This is just a mutational burden uh, slide showing that um, mutation burdens associated with efficacy. But I'm going to end with this. If you stratify cancer by mutational burden, that's how we looked at it to begin with. That's how we picked mismatch repair deficiency to be the tumor type that we, that we started off treating. You can look at tumors that are non-responders, and they typically have an incredibly low mutational burden. You can have tumors that are strong responders, like mismatch repair deficient tumors, pole deficient tumors, another, mis another DNA repair defect, or patients with biallelic MRD. Both alleles of, their, uh, of the mismatch repair deficiency machinery are, are not working. These are all strong responders. And then you have these tumors in the middle, like the ones I presented in lung or melanoma. They're the mixed responders, and they have an intermediate number of mutations. So the question is, is will this hold up for sporadic adult solid tumors. There are exceptions. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, why is that responding? Um, why are, are certain urothelial or gastric cancers responding so well and others are not? So is that purely defined by mutational burden or are there other factors? Uh, and that will remain to be seen. So this is the last slide. This is the ev evolution of checkpoint inhibition and the FDA approvals across tumor types. The real excitement was in melanoma initially with IPI, moved to PD-1 blockade, but slowly, and what made it real to us as medical oncologists was the activity in lung cancer. I think prior to this, we thought melanoma was an immunogenic tumor, obviously it's gonna work there, but the second it worked in lung cancer, I think it surprised everyone. And we're then seeing an evolution of this into other tumors like renal cell carcinoma, bladder cancer, head and neck cancers, um, Merkel cell cancer, and then more recently, the pan tumor uh, in adults and children for MSI high. Uh, we saw recently the gastric approval and the HCC approval. We will continue to see approvals, but we need more biology to help define what these subgroups for response are, uh, and I think uh, mutational burden will be one of those. So I'm gonna stop there, and thank you very much. As Dr. Diaz nicely introduced, there's kind of two pieces to the immunotherapy diagnostics. There's the diagnostic piece of PDL1, and I'll be the one to address that. And then there's the diagnostic piece of MMR or DNA based um, um, repair type response to, PD to uh, PDL1 inhibitors. And uh, Lynette Scholl will talk about the pathologist role in those diagnostic tests. So um, let's talk about PDL1 first. This is uh, something that um, really. Uh, for the first time, arguably since HER2, or if not more, more technically since ALK, was the first time we had a companion diagnostic test. And so uh, where are we today? So going, um, going back to uh, 2014, some of the first lung cancer patients, and all of these papers that I'm showing you, and Dr. Diaz just reviewed, um, 
all showed an effect of PDL1. In fact, this uh, review by Sunshine and Taub shows that in, in nearly every tumor type, and you can see them in abbreviations on the bottom, the PDL1 expressors essentially always did better than the non expressors. And in fact, even when you combine the PDL1 inhibitor Nevo with ipilimumab, PDL1 expression still was predictive. And so, as much as um, you know, the, the ideal or you know, the precision medicine approach using DNA has been really um, stealing the day in some sense, here's a chance for pathologists to do good old IHC and actually uh, make a contribution in pricking responders to therapy. And so what, what do we have and where are we really now in terms of drugs? And you just got a, a great overview of the timing of the approvals of these drugs, but here are the key drugs that have been approved. Um, there are first approval dates here, and then the cancers in which they're approved. But I want to talk about the diagnostic test that's improved with them, because each of them has their own diagnostic test that is an assay, and each of them has a different designation. Now, I don't have all of the sub-designations here, but just uh, suffice it to say you can see that there's sort of two categories. There's complementary diagnostic tests and there's companion diagnostic tests. So this didn't exist a few years ago, but it's become a terminology now that I think we all need to be familiar with. A companion diagnostic test is a test result that's required for the prescription of the drug. So what does it mean required? Presumably that means it's in the label, in the FDA label for approval of the drug, that the patients must be qualified by having a positive test. Um, this, is, um, this category is usually given by the agency when the test is used to enroll patients. But as we saw just a couple weeks ago, not always. That is, sometimes they might still give a companion diagnostic designation even if the diagnostic test wasn't an enrollment criteria. Now, complementary diagnostic test was actually a new term to all of us just a few years ago. Mostly this category has been used in the past when all patients, or when you had an all-comers trial, but it was observed that patients with, that were test positive were more likely to respond, but there were also responders in the test negative category. And because of that, we saw the ev evolution of this new category, a complementary diagnostic test. So um, what about the tests and the, or the assays, and what about the antibodies? And I want to go over those things now. So um, there have been a number of studies that have compared the different assays. Because remember, there's five drugs with four different assays, and each assay is supplied in a different um, kit or a different IVD test. And are those assays all the same? And what about LDTs? Many pathology labs do LDTs. In fact, probably most of your IHC testing is LDT-based. And so is that a possible uh, alternative for PDL1 testing as well? So the first study, and perhaps uh, the first one that came out, and the first one to be talked about a lot, is this study by Hirsch and his team, which actually represented each of the vendors of the IVD tests, as well as four of the five uh, pharma companies that provided the material and the agreement for this study. And then secondly, the NCCN gathered a group of academic pathologists together to produce this study, and that's why I'm before you today, because I was the leader with uh, Ignacio Westuba of this comparison study. I, I like to use this example, because I'm going to try to get this right as I speak to you. I'll try to always talk about the assay or the test, and that means the IVD itself, not the antibody. Although the antibody is the key difference, the way I see it is the antibody is the egg, it's an ingredient, and the assay is the cake, the test. So here they are. Here's the assays for lung cancer, uh, 28.8, which is the name of the antibody uh, for nivolumab, and each has a different scoring system as well. So this was designated as a complementary diagnostic test with three cut points, greater than 1, greater than 5, or greater than 10 percent. 22C3 uh, matched with pembrolizumab, but in this case only two cut points, greater than 1 percent and greater than 50 percent, both of these including a zero cut point as well. The SP142 test was for atezolizumab, and here they had a much more complicated scoring system with three different categories, or actually four if you include zero, for immune cells, and then three categories, or a fourth if you include zero, for tumor cells. And then finally, SP263, the match for devalumab, and again, uh, a, still another cut point at greater than 25 percent. So those are, that's what's out there. Now, how do these all compare? So they don't look the same. This is actually uh, images right from the blueprint study. And the blueprint study showed that 
they have different colors or different appearances, but also that SP142 seemed to be negative in the same regions or serial sections of cases that were positive for the other assays. And in fact, we were told that the assay for SP142 was enriched for immune cells, and that's illustrated here, although it's not clear what the biology is that can have an antibody bind to an antigen in one type of cell and not another type of cell. The NCCN study found a similar thing uh, where we found the SP142 assay seemed to be less strong than the other assays. This is actually the summary of these two studies since they're the largest studies. I'm not mentioning the study by Scheele at this point had only 16 patients. This, patient, this study has 39 cases with no outcome data, was read by three pathologists, and had four, and had four of the five assays, or four of the FDA uh, IUO assays, was not statistically powered, but was really a challenge because it required all these players to all agree on it. The NCCN study, uh, led by myself and Ignacio, was a lot easier to design in that we took a we had a biostatistician help us, give us a power calculation, which means we need 90 cases. We had 13 pathologists from seven academic sites, and we tested three of the four IUO assays, but we also added an LDT, realizing that sometimes that's how pathologists perform their tests. Uh, this was led by NCCN, and you can see the very similar patterns that we saw. Now you can see that um, the, the outlier here in both cases is SP142, but if you look carefully at this data, and especially if you go to the paper in JAMA Oncology, you can see there's actually subtle differences between the other markers as well if you look at all 13 pathologists at once. This was true not only of the tumor cells, but also of the immune cells in the NCCN study, but because the blueprint study had fewer patients, it wasn't seen in that study. In summary of the blueprint study, they tried to integrate all the scoring systems together, and what they found if you integrate them each by their own cutoff is that the cases in the blue box represent 63% of the population, and those are the ones where the four tests are concordant. But that means that 37% are discordant, which suggests they certainly shouldn't be used uh, interchangeably. NCCN study showed a little different pattern, although what we did in that study is we tried to include everybody's scoring system. And by doing that, we had a six-point scoring system, and you can see that we found the higher, the higher percentages of scores were positive in patients that had the three tests, including the LDT test, which was E1L3N performed on a Leica bond. The SP142 had the highest frequency of low scores, as was seen in the blueprint. Um, and then uh, this was also seen in the immune cell scoring. This is the tumor cell scoring. This is the immune cell scoring. And again, we saw um, in the SB142 test at a lower level. Another uh, study was performed and published shortly thereafter in 2017 by uh, Dr. Radcliffe, and they looked at the concordance between the uh, three different antibodies initially and showed concordance or overall percent agreement in the 90% range, and then as a second sub-study um, did SP263, but saw a similar drop in overall percent agreement. And in fact, the most recent study, which came out last week from a Scandinavian group led by Brunstmanel, found again the same thing for the four IVD assays, that is, comparing any two with the exception of 142 showed a very high concordance, but lower concordance on all the comparisons with SP142. So there's now been four, arguably five studies in the literature that show this, so I think we know that the assays are certainly not interchangeable, and there seems to be Rel relatively high similarity between three or arguably four, including the LDT, um, and, and uh, for, for the assays um, 28 263 and 22C3, and then the LDT with E1L3N. So now I want to talk briefly about the antibodies, and I'll go more quickly through this, and that is um, the eggs themselves, and are the antibodies the same? And there's actually more antibodies than we've found, and in fact, there are in my own lab, we tested a wide range of antibodies, actually about 10 or 12 antibodies, and found many of them did not validate. That is, they either didn't express only, uh, bind only PDL1, or if they bound PDL1, they also bound something else. In fact, some of the antibodies were seen in the nucleus, which is not a place where PDL1 has been reported. And so these are, this is a subset of the antibodies that we tested in the lab, and uh, their information about each antibody. 
And this is all published in uh, JAMA Oncology, so you can download it. But basically what we found quantifying by quantitative fluorescence or by DAB stains uh, using the aperial pixel counter quantification is that the antibodies themselves, when not run in the IVD, that is the antibodies um, with the exception of 28.8 and 22C3, which were the IVD, the rest were in LDT format, uh, are equivalent. The eggs are the same, the cakes are different. This is verified by uh, uh, Sunshine et al. and Janice Taub's lab at Hopkins where they looked in melanoma at 5H1. This was the original antibody made by Li Ping Chen uh, and, and published in earlier studies and then the four other antibodies that are in the IVD test and Janice basically found the same thing that the antibodies themselves including SP142 are equivalent although the assay in which SP142 is included is systematically lower than the other assays. So um, what about the scoring system? So one of the things that I think is important to look at is how well the pathologist can actually score. And as part of the NCCN study, we looked at the concordance in the assays of the tumor cells and the concordance in the assays in the immune cells. And what we found is that the concordance was great when we looked at the tumor cells. These are ICCs, which any time an ICC above is above 0.75, that's considered a highly um, highly accurate or highly uh, concordant assay, whereas um, anything below 0.4 is considered unacceptable. And what we saw for ICC is we were unable in 13 different pathologists to come up with concordance. Now I should add that at the time we did this was before there was um, more widespread training for this assay. And so these pathologists all read these assays as you know, board certified pathologists without any specific training on how to read immune cells. And finally, there's another important observation was made from this test, and that was looking at the cutoffs. And what we found, and perhaps not surprising to any pathologists in the audience, when we had to choose a 50% cutoff, we had very high concordance measured by two different parameters. Whereas when we were forced to choose a 1% cutoff, we saw the concordance drop pretty substantially, but still in a reasonable range. Um, this, co this concordance difference was also seen by Brunstam et al. in their recent paper where they saw the discordance was higher, and you can see the discordance cases in the outside of these, uh, when they used less than 1% compared to greater than 50% where they saw significantly higher concordance. When we use a high cut point, we're likely to succeed in terms of pathologist concordance. Lower cut points are more challenging. So the last thing I want to talk about happened last week and in fact isn't even published yet, but I think it's really important for pathologists to know about, and that is that the FDA grants accelerated approval to Prembolizumab for advanced gastric cancer with a companion diagnostic test. So even though we had all those other complementary diagnostic tests, and it was really only Pembrolizumab that required companion diagnostic tests, we now have another indication, that is in gastric cancer, where a companion diagnostic test is required. Turns out this is not published yet. It was presented at ESMO, and what they found is that patients who uh, expressed PDL1 were more likely to respond than those did not, with response rates of 16% versus 6%. And so um, the last slide is how do we score this? And the answer is there's uh, sessions going on, and I encourage you to go to those sessions to learn how to score it. I'm not sure I'm qualified to score yet. If you buy 22C3, you receive from Agilent the new scoring guide for 22C3, the updated revised label, and that gives you this information on CPS, combined uh, a proportion score, which is the number of PDL1 staining cells, including tumor cells, lymphocytes, and macrophages, divided by the total number of cells times 100. And then the cut point is greater than one or less than one. And I'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the discussion perhaps, but arguably it's too early. We haven't, the uh, summary of safety and effectiveness data, which is uh, what the FDA publishes so that you can see how the assays perform, is not even published yet. So perhaps a little early, but just something to keep on your radar. And so that was the, the IHC part. And now what we're going to have uh, next is, is Lynette, Dr. Lynette Scholl is going to present the um, MSI, uh, MMR aspect of this, and then we'll have time for uh, questions and discussion. Well, my oncology colleagues like to joke that if they don't like my PDL1 score, they just leave and come back 10 minutes later and hope I give them a different answer. So I'm glad I'm talking about something that I find a little bit more concrete, the MMR, MSI status as well as tumor mutational burden. And 
So uh, I'm sure this audience has a significant degree of famili familiarity with MMR and MSI testing since this is something we've been doing for many, many years, uh, for largely for Lynch syndrome screening. Um, I will review it briefly and talk about uh, the assays that, that we can consider using in the context of immuno-oncology. So uh, just to recap the biology, mismatch repair deficiency results from inactivation of one of the members of the MMR pathway. And uh, you can see in the schematic here, MLH1, PMS2, uh, predominantly, as well as MSH2 and MSH6. Uh, the first two, MLH1 and PMS2, form a heterodimer, as do MSH2 and MSH6, and they all come together to perform the activities of mismatch repair when there's either a single base mismatch in the course of DNA replication, or when there's an error in the uh, course of uh, replicating uh, repetitive stretches of DNA. So you can see small insertion deletion mutations that occur when there's some strand slippage and your, your uh, intrinsic polymerases have trouble uh, replicating, say, 25 A's in a row. And they maybe make 26 A's, and then the MMR uh, proteins come in and they clip out that extra A and return it to its baseline state. This can also uh, uh, repair larger insertion deletion mutations. So of course, uh, we are very familiar with the fact that when you see uh, errors in these mismatch repair proteins that are conferred by the presence of a mutation in the germline in one of these genes, that these patients are at increased risk of hereditary cancer syndrome, uh, named Lynch syndrome. These folks have an increased risk of colon, uh, endometrial cancers, as well as other, uh, other cancer types. Of course, uh, these folks will walk around with a uh, single hit in their germline uh, in one of these genes, and a second or somatic hit is required to actually uh, initiate tumorigenesis. The other context that we see mismatch deficiency, of course, is in patients who have sporadic silencing, particularly of MLH1 promoter. Um, and this is actually a very common uh, mechanism of mismatch repair deficiency in colon and endometrium. And finally, we are also seeing somatic mutations. And I think increasingly, as we're doing more uh, sequencing of patients, we're finding somatic mutations that are actually the, uh, the etiology of mismatch repair deficiency in patients who don't have an underlying Lynch syndrome. I think, interestingly, there's actually different mutational phenotypes uh, resulting from mutations in the different members of this pathway. So for instance, patients who have mutations in PMS2 or MSH6 uh, in the context of Lynch syndrome often have a more attenuated phenotype. They may not come to clinical attention until later in life. In addition, patients who, who have MSH6 mutations appear to have a somewhat different type of mutational spectrum. We tend to see an increased number of these single base mismatches, but not as many insertion deletion mutations, whereas the insertion deletion mutation type of phenotype is very common in patients with, say, MLH1 or MSH2 mutations. So acceptable testing strategies from the standpoint of hereditary uh, colon, colon cancer or hereditary cancer syndrome testing, we've been using mismatch repair deficiency testing by IHC for many years. We've been using microsatellite instability testing by PCR. Um, but I think increasingly we're seeing um, entry of next generation sequencing techniques uh, as well. So of course, uh, here are some requisite images of uh, immunohistochemistry. Here is a poorly differentiated carcinoma that actually had a somatic MSH6 mutation. And you can see, in this particular case, uh, loss of staining of MSH6 with intact uh, expression in the nuclei of surrounding stromal cells. I think, interestingly, we see a, a slight diminishment of the MSH2 uh, protein expression. These uh, two proteins, MSH2 and MSH6, form a heterodimer. MSH2 is actually the obligate member of that dimer. So if you have a mutation in MSH2, you inevitably lose expression of MSH6 as well. But the opposite is not true. In this case, however, it's interesting that we seem to have some relative uh, decrease in the amount of MSH2 that's actually coming into, into, this, uh, to, into this complex. Of course, MLH1 and PMS2 retain their expression strongly. Uh, in, in general, we should see relatively robust staining uh, in internal control um, nuclei, in particular proliferating uh, areas of the tissue. We also tend to see higher levels of expression in the tumor cells just because these are cells that are replicating more, um, more rapidly than the, uh, the normal uh, cells in the background. And these are the types of proteins that are going to be more highly expressed in the replicating nucleus. 
Uh, we also have microsatellite um, instability testing, or MSI testing. This has been around a long time. We've recognized that these microsatellites, which essentially are repetitive elements within the genome, exist throughout the genome. And we actually are, have been looking at very interesting areas of the genome for a long time when we've been looking at these microsatellites. Many of these actually exist in very commonly studied oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And so you can actually infer some very interesting um, data about allelic imbalance or loss of heterozygosity surrounding these areas of microsatellites by, by studying these. The old school way of looking at microsatellites was by doing uh, gel electrophoresis, performing PCR around an area where a microsatellite exists, performing gel electrophoresis. Of course, if you just turn that 90 degrees and you put a fluorescent tag on it, you can look at it on a capillary electrophoresis and get a much more uh, kind of clean and precise look at the, um, at the microsatellite. Um, and in this particular example, we're looking at uh, two different patterns uh, of microsatellites. One is a mononucleotide repeat. This is a, a BAT, B BAT, which stands for big A tract, and we'll see what that looks like in a kind of sequencing context uh, in a couple of slides. Um, another type of microsatellite that is commonly tested are dinucleotide repeats, so AT, 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 AT. And you can see that actually even in the normal tissue, we tend to see what is really a Gaussian distribution around these um, areas of microsatellites. And, and that is because uh, in, in even around uh, in a normal tissue, the polymerases that are uh, replicating um, these areas of the DNA are going to have some slippage. So in the test tube, you're going to see a little bit of variation around that uh, microsatellite. So potentially the, the true length of the microsatellite is 25 nucleotides. But within the test tube, you're going to get a population anywhere from, say, 20 to 30 nucleotides. And as a result, you get this, you get this distribution. However, if the tumor has a defect in repairing uh, these, these repetitive regions, you end up getting this very stretched out uh, population. You get what's called a little bit of shouldering. You can get very strange morphologies rather than this, this sort of nice normal distribution. And the same thing can be seen both in mononucleotide repeats as well as dinucleotide repeats. So uh, there have been many, many um, uh, years of testing used uh, uh, for microsatellite instability. The um, revised Bethesda guidelines have been around for a long time. In fact, this particular um, set of guidelines was published in 2004. And anybody who's been working in a molecular lab is probably quite familiar with these. Most labs are testing five microsatellites throughout the genome. If none of these are unstable, you consider the, the tumor to be microsatellite stable. If one is unstable, it's considered to be MSI low. And two or more is considered MSI high. Uh, we know that MSI high status correlates with Lynch syndrome. It also uh, correlates with sporadic uh, loss of uh, mismatch repair function. Whereas MSI low and microsatellite stable cases appear to be largely clinical pathologically similar, and we really don't know exactly what this MSI low category means, in particular uh, in, in relevance to immuno-oncology response. Uh, it does not appear to be associated with Lynch syndrome. A couple of things I want to point out that are kind of in the, the fine text here in the uh, Bethesda guidelines is, is that uh, when you don't have paired normal uh, tissue to test, to compare your, uh, your tumor to, uh, you are suggested to use what are called quasi-monomorphic mononucleotide repeats. So essentially, these are areas of the genome that are quite stable in the population and tend to occur uh, to have the same conformation on both alleles in the, in the genome. So they have a very predictable appearance when you perform PCR. Um, so, so by choosing your mononucleotide repeats or by choosing your microsatellites um, carefully, you can potentially run an assay without having paired normal tissue. And uh, I think that, that can be very helpful uh, in today's laboratory when you may be asked to be running um, MSI PCR on a greater number of, uh, of cases. So this is what these microsatellites look like if you actually look at the genome directly. So here is a big A tract, and it's actually aptly named BAT26 because there are 26 A's here. This is actually located just uh, next to the splice region of MSH2 and will very commonly be altered in a patient who has mismatch repair deficiency. You can see that even in a normal uh, specimen that there is some slippage around these, um, these bats, which we are able to see in those uh, gel electrophoresis and capillary electrophoresis images. However, in a mismatch repair deficient tumor, you can see that there's a significant amount of, of error around, uh, around this tract in terms of, of inability to repair it correctly. 
So I think the question probably many of us have asked ourselves and our oncology colleagues is, is what do we do now that there is essentially a universal indication for uh, testing MSI in any solid tumor type for adults or for children? Uh, many of us already offer universal testing for colon uh, and potentially also for endometrial uh, cancers for the, for the indication of Lynch syndrome. Uh, the challenge, however, is that uh, you can see MSI in many different contexts, as Dr. Diaz has already pointed out. And, and how, do you, how do you make a decision as a lab in terms of, of what kind of additional testing you're going to offer on a routine basis um, for, for your different, uh, different indications? And this is a very nice analysis that was um, published using TCGA data uh, that essentially did a pan cancer evaluation of MSI status. I would point out that it, it seems like it, it's fairly obvious that we should indeed be doing universal testing in endometrial cancer because there is nearly a 30% rate of MSI high status in this context. Colon cancer as well, not surprisingly, has uh, uh, more than a 15% uh, rate of, of MSI high. And here's gastric cancer, 22%. So you might argue that we should be rut doing routine gastric cancer MSI or MMR testing. If you start looking at the bottom of the list, however, you see there are certain tumor types where uh, MSI is very rare. And we, we do know from Dr. Diaz's data that there are thyroid cancers out there that are MSI high, but apparently none of them made it into the, uh, the pan cancer TCGA analysis, possibly because these have somewhat different morphologies than our traditional thyroid cancers and were not actually included in these, in these types of analyses. Um, also, if you look at some other very common tumor types, such as lung adenocarcinoma, where only one out of 482 tumors that were sequenced seems to have MSI, it becomes very difficult to rationalize, say, doing universal MSI or MMR testing in that tumor type. Um, rather, you're probably looking at scenarios where there's potentially a higher yield uh, from, uh, from the clinical standpoint to, to do this type of testing. pdl one testing might be the better biomarker in this scenario as well, but potentially both of these things may be informative in some cases. So uh, I think Dr. Diaz has already covered this very clearly. I just think having access to sequencing data is also very informative to really see what is going on underneath the hood in these tumors. Um, here's a very characteristic MMR proficient colon cancer compared to the genome of a mismatch repair um, uh, deficient colon cancer. You can see two, two very striking features, very low number of mutations in our MMR proficient with a striking degree of genomic instability, so lots of genomic gains and losses as a, compared to our MMR deficient colon cancers, which have huge numbers of mutations and a virtually silent uh, copy number profile, so a very different mechanism of tumorigenesis going on in these two contexts. And we've already talked about neoantigen presentations. So mismatch repair looks like a pretty good biomarker. Are there other um, kind of mutational-based biomarkers that we should be thinking about in predicting response to immuno-oncology? Uh, new antigen burden. So we've talked about the fact that MMR deficiency leads to an increased number of new antigens. Um, I think some of these studies, the numbers are still too small to know for sure how new antigen uh, burden in and of itself is predictive of response. Um, but there's certainly a trend towards, uh, towards predicting as much. And, uh, and let's talk a little bit about tumor mutation burden, because MMR is certainly not the whole story across all tumor types. It's certainly a mechanism to drive very high levels of, of mutation and potentially neoantigen presentation. But again, I think as Dr. Diaz pointed out, there's a huge uh, variability across tumor types in terms of the number of mutations that are present. And that's probably largely driven by the types of uh, mutational processes that are associated with tumorigenesis in these different tumor types. And if we look at these tumors that have high mutational signatures um, uh, more closely, we can see very um, uh, discrete patterns arising here. And potentially, these patterns of mutations within these tumors may be informative as well. And, and this is publicly available data that you can get from uh, the Cosmic Database, the Sanger Cosmic Database. And you can actually look at these different signatures and see that these will correlate uh, specifically with certain uh, types of, of mutagenesis. So for instance, signature 7, which is characterized by a large number of C to T uh, transitions um, is, is characteristic of UV uh, mutagenesis. Signature 4, which is characterized by a large number of GDT transversions, is characteristic of smoking. And, and these are very obvious signatures that you can see within, uh, within sequencing data and may be very informative in, um, in understanding what tumor will and will not respond to, to treatment. 
Um, and this is an interesting uh, study that, that was published um, earlier this year, led by McGranahan, showing that in, in lung cancers who, um, who are smokers, they tend to have a higher tumor mutational burden, which I think is no surprise. Uh, these tend to have higher levels of neoantigen formation and ultimately have a phenotype of increased adaptive immunity. And this is the type of, of phenotype that we would predict would be responsive to immunotherapeutics. And, and this, I think, is really kind of getting into the weeds, but when, uh, when you actually dissect out the different uh, neoantigens that actually exist within these, uh, these lung cancers, uh, understanding the patterns of neoantigen formation actually seems to predict response as well. Um, and so what this essentially is telling us is that if you have a tumor that has um, essentially a, a clonal neoantigen burden, so every single tumor cell in the population has uh, neoantigens presented on its surface, and you can see in some cases you have five or 600 neoantigens per, um, per tumor, that these are much more likely to respond to immunotherapy. And also, interestingly, these, these tumors that have a clonal new antigen burden tend to have a very striking tobacco mutational signature. In contrast, those tumors that have a subclonal neoantigen, i.e. new antigens that are only present in a subset of the tumor cells, do not seem to uh, respond as well to immunotherapies. And the authors here speculated that potentially the evolution of subclonal new antigens may be a result of prior chemotherapies. Um, and then just finally, you know, I think practically speaking, um, thinking about what we might need to consider in a clinical laboratory, I think most of us are not going to be running neoantigen analysis on our patient's tumors. Um, you generally need whole exome or whole genome sequencing to do that. Um, many times I can't figure out if my patient has a KRAS mutation, let alone whether they've got a new antigen that's going to predict response. Um, but is, is there kind of a happy medium? Is there something that we can use as a potential biomarker that's practical? Um, tumor mutation burden in and of itself may actually be a, a viable biomarker. Um, this is a, a little bit more analysis of the study that Dr. Diaz presented earlier from uh, Checkmate 026 that showed that nivolumab did not uh, perform better than chemo in the first line in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. But in the retrospective analyses, if you take into account the patient's tumor mutation burden plus the pdl one status, you actually see a 75% response rate to this drug in the first line as compared to 25% with chemo alone. If, however, you look at uh, a high PDL1, greater than 50%, with a low tumor mutation burden, you see no difference relative to chemotherapy. So there's some signal surrounding tumor mutation burden in this context. And indeed, if you look at tumor mutation burden in, uh, in and of itself, irrespective of PDL1 status, you see an improved response rate and progression free survival. Do you need whole exome sequencing data? No, you can actually derive high tumor mutational burden from targeted uh, panels as well down to about 300 genes, as far as we can tell. If you drop far below that, that, that correlation with the tumor burden from uh, whole exome sequencing begins to drop off. Um, and then finally, you can also use more targeted gene panels, such as a 300 or 400 gene panel, to actually detect mismatch repair deficiencies. So if you're looking for a universal way to do mutational um, profiling, as well as MMR uh, testing, uh, targeted next-gen sequencing uh, can actually provide that information. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Rim. Dr. Scholl will present a case that really happened at her institution, and that will lead off the discussion. Um, so what we want to do now is talk a little bit about heterogeneity. Um, these are actually all IHC um, images that uh, Dr. Scholl has provided in the context of this case. So Dr. Scholl. I open my email. Dear Dr. Scholl. You recently signed out a PDL1 stain for my patient, Mrs. Smith. She is 55 and a smoker with a large suprahyalur adenocarcinoma with METs to lymph nodes and soft tissue. You said her BAL fluid was 90% positive. However, your colleague also reviewed a lymph node sample and said that specimen was 40% positive. She's in the infusion center awaiting her first line chemotherapy. But should I switch to pembrolizumab? Please help. Here's the BAL. <coughs> PDL1 IHC uh, was reported at 90% tumor cell staining. You can see the very nice, crisp membranous staining there in the majority of the tumor cells in the field. Obviously, a little bit posse-cellular, but as you scan around, you could get probably two or 300 cells in the field. And here is a scalene lymph node biopsy, which was reported at 40% tumor cell staining. And there's a low power view 
and there's a higher power of U, and there's a little bit of variability in terms of the intensity. You sort of stare at it long enough, you can maybe hit about 40% of between weak to, to strong staining uh, of the tumor cells. So how would you advise the confused oncologist? The vast majority of the people recommended giving immunotherapy, and I assume that was on the basis of cytology. So I want to take that, because remember, the first session is a cytology specimen, and actually, cytology specimens aren't in the label for this test. But you all kind of converted it and said, well, it's a cytology. It's probably going to work. It's a cell block. And in fact, um, move forward. And in fact, what I didn't get to present is a number of cytology comparison studies have been done between cytology, um, IHC, and on cell blocks, not on fresh specimens, but on cell blocks and tumors. And those show generally very high concordance in the 90 plus percent range. Now, you could argue we rec recommend giving chemotherapy because in the lymph node specimen, uh, there was less than 50% positivity, so thereby uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate for uh, immunotherapy in the first line. But I'll let Dr. Scholl speak on this topic. Well, <laughs> I actually recommend chemotherapy to the, uh, to the clinician based on the fact that the label strictly has not examine cytology specimens in particular, and, uh, and having reviewed both of them side by side and, and realizing there was quite a bit of discrepancy between the percentage that was showing in the lymph node versus in the cytology. Again, I don't know. I mean, so there is no right yeah, answer here. No right answer. This, is, this is just state of the art. This is where we are today. And we're fortunate to have an oncologist with us. <laughs> so let's see what Dr. Diaz thinks. <clears throat> So uh, I would probably treat with immunotherapy. Uh, chemotherapy does have limitations, and you can always go back and treat with chemotherapy afterwards. And the first question is about uh, MLH1 and PMS1. It says MLH1 and PMS1 are expressed in all tumor cells of a given mass. When one has heterogeneity, how is the treatment option considered, or how are treatment options considered? Do you want to field that one? Well, I Dr. guess Shane? I guess you know the first the first thing is heterogeneity is fairly unusual. I think when we initiated endometrial um, cancer screening, which we did about two years ago, we started seeing more heterogeneity. I think there than we were seeing in the colon cancer space, and and we we are um, interpreting the heterogeneity that we're seeing there as acquisition of somatic mutations in uh, one of the mismatch repair genes in the course of tumorigenesis. Um, we have not looked at it comprehensively to know if those tumors actually are pole mutated because we know these, these tumors have exceptionally high rates of, of mutation. You can certainly see multiple mutational signatures within a single tumor. You can have a pole mutation initiating the process, acquiring mutations within your mismatch repair genes, and going on to develop mismatch repair uh, de deficiency in subclones of the tumor. You could probably argue if that's the scenario, the patient's likely to be responsive to, to immunotherapy, if it's a different kind of just sporadic um, alteration that's a subclonal alteration, I think it's harder to know how the patient would respond um, overall. Okay. Um, very good. Um, the next question that has come up was um, a question, um, why do we even do pdl one on cytology if it is not labeled use? <laughs> and so I guess um, the um, we can, we can t uh, each, each opine on that. I would say um, clearly uh, cytology specimens come from the same source of the tumor, and so arguably um, you could say, uh, in fact, in some labs, it's a very fine line. What is a cytology specimen and what is a, um, a small biopsy? And so you could, and a small biopsy is actually what is on the label, is a small biopsy, often endoscopic, but can be also confused for cytology. So what is a cytology by definition as a cytopathologist is that it's often not formalin fixed. And I think that's the variable that people are concerned about. But um, the minimum number of cells is that is required uh, for the on-label test is 100 cells. And we all know that many times our cytology specimens have many more than 100 cells. And many times our biopsy specimens have many fewer, or some fewer than 100 cells are completely inadequate. So I think if you use the 100 cell guideline, um, I'm comfortable with returning the data. In fact, in SignOut, I return cytology specimen data to the clinicians with a disclaimer on the bottom that says, technically, this is not in the label uh, since it is a cytology specimen. 
Annette? We're not even that sophisticated. We take what we can get. I think, of course, the challenge is, you know, you, that's all you have on a patient. So you don't have the luxury of saying, oh, go back and get me the biopsy specimen. It's, it's either you test this or uh, you, don't, you test nothing at all. Um, so, so we report it out just as we would a, a surgical specimen. I, I, from a medical oncologist perspective, I think um, reimbursement and getting the drug can be an issue. And if, if the payers or the hospital or the pharmacy in the hospital, the P&T committee has strict guidelines that can, that can really uh, make things difficult. So it's hospital to hospital, payer to payer, institution to institution. Okay, here's a question for the oncologist. What is the rationale for combining IPI and NEVO instead of sequential treatment considering the expression of CTLA early and PD-1 late? So the, the, the hope was that you, since they're working by different mechanisms of action, um, that you would potentiate the response. Um, and we were seeing mixed responses in melanoma and in lung cancer and even renal cell with response rates in the 20 to 40%. Uh, varying by first and second line. And the hope was that we could achieve a higher response rate and therefore then a higher durable overall response rate and better PFS and OS. Um, there are studies looking at these sequentially. Uh, so for instance, in IPI failures, then treating with PD-1, or in PD-1 failures, adding IPI. Um, so th the real answer is that we don't know and we'll know better probably in two to three years. Um, but the initial rationale was to potentiate the response. Thank you. Um, back to uh, a pathology question. Uh, does companion diagnostic apply to the antibody clone only or both the clone and the platform? It seems that the 22C3 clone is now available to be validated and run on other platforms like the Ventana platform. So I think it's uh, very important to realize that the FDA approval is for the whole platform. That is the stainer, the antibody, the, all the reagents that go with it, and the scoring system. So as soon as you take things apart and don't do exactly what's in the entire um, uh, platform, then it's no longer an FDA approved. Now, is it correct to say that using um, 22C3 is the FDA approved antibody. Well, it's part of an, a, a in vitro diagnostic test that is FDA approved, but it's probably not correct to say, and in fact it is an LDT, if you use the 22C3 antibody not in the context of the uh, DACO Link 48 test. In fact, um, using the exact um, criteria that are stipulated in the testing manual. Um, any comment? Do you want to comment on that? Or? No further okay. No further comment. <laughs> okay. Um, another question um, is uh, more for oncologists. Has resistance ever been reported or identified post-immunotherapy? So, so that's a great question. Um, it's still evolving but there's primary resistance and secondary resistance. And there is data that suggests that mutations in the machinery responsible for class one presentation, um, either in beta two microglobulin or other genes related to uh, the signaling or, or expression of class one um, may be responsible for um, acquired resistance. I don't think that there is convincing data yet in that area, um, certainly not convincing with mesotrichia pair deficient tumors. Most of that data is in melanoma. Um, so, so the answer, the simple answer is no. We don't, we don't have a good feel for the mechanism of acquired resistance. There is clinical resistance, but we don't know why. So we do have a few examples where there have been, uh, for example, the MHC2 gene mutation, right. but um, the Acquired resistance is certainly going to be an area of, I think, a lot of uh, interesting studies in the not too distant future. The more and more patients that you get that show resistance, the more substrate, if you will, for right. uh, future assessment of what the cause of that acquired resistance is. Um, Just one, one point, you have one point on that. The question is it tumor cell intrinsic or extrinsic? And I think, um, at least with targeted therapy, it's always been intrinsic. Uh, we don't know, is it going to be microenvironment or tumor cell? 
one of the uh, pathologists in the audience, I assume, asked, since lymph node mets, or since the lymph node met is the aggressive clone, shouldn't PDL1 score be based more on the score from the lymph nodes than from the primary? What do you think? There's such, such uh, well, I think there's such extraordinary heterogeneity at all of the sites that it's very difficult to know um, what the best site is to go after. I think in theory, yes, we'd like to know what's happening at the, at the metastasis uh, in particular, but it's rare that we actually see the whole thing. So we're, we're looking at a, 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 sub, a very small subset of, of a subset of the tumor and we're extrapolating from there. So I think you know, it's really a very inexact science at, at best. Could I, could I ask a question based on that? So what about focusing on the invasive front? It seems like that's where all the action is, and um, yeah, at least in the example I showed, the tumor was quite cold for, uh, for PDL one expression. So actually, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about doing something similar to you did, what you did, which is looking at multiple um, uh, lymphocyte parameters as opposed to tumor cell parameters. In the last 10 minutes or so here, I'll um, talk about some tests on the horizon. Um, but the, I, would, I would say in answer to that, that in some tumors, that's clearly the case. And colon and melanoma are two tumor types that that's clearly the case. In lung cancer, we can't always tell what's the invasive front. And in fact, in breast cancer, where it's more of a spiculated tumor, would the ends of those spicules be the invasive front or not? And so people have started talking about the tumor stromal margin or the tumor stromal border as a way to sort of say, okay, we know there's something going on here, but is that really the leading edge? Right. And so in some tumors, I think it's likely to be more, possi more possible to even do, but it's tricky because we never know, especially if we get a tiny biopsy, we don't really know if it's at the invasive front. So new and emerging directions in biomarker development for cancer immunotherapy. How can we do better than what we're doing? And I'll start this by saying that you can see, we started with IHC, and you can see that there's a lot of interest in MMR uh, as a diagnostic test. And there's a lot of interest that didn't come out so much here, but in other sessions will probably come out related to total mutational burden, or TMB. And so I think that in some ways, those are um, on the horizon as well, but we kind of already covered that. What I want to talk about is RNA expression-based methods, that is expression profiling, and then some protein-based methods a way to assess activated T cells, or T cells, not too dissimilar from what Dr. Diaz showed. And then finally, the potential to determine the capacity to express PDL1, which is active in a few different labs, including my own. So this is some work from Ayers et al., where they looked at uh, tumors and then took the FFPE and put them into a nanostring platform to actually discover a series of genes, and they went through a few different series of genes that would predict response. That is, would be correlated with response to therapy and not to non-response. And what they found is they could do this by doing a heat map, as you can see here. They could define a series of genes where the responders are clustered in this group here and not so much down here. And so these 18 genes were put into a, um, a signature, and then that signature was tested. And this was uh, just published a few, a few weeks ago, actually. And you can see that when they tested that signature, they looked at the area under the curve, and the area under the curve for the signature, the GEP score, is 0.75 compared to PDL1 IHC, which was 0.65 in the same cohort. So um, I think this represents sort of a potential future direction. Um, you can see how they sort of picked the genes that they picked, and the genes that they picked the RNA from all play a role in uh, either tumor cell, T cell interactions, or uh, the actual um, PDL1 itself, PDL2, which is a related family member, um, some immune, other immune inhibitors, and other uh, less characterized um, genes, including antigen presenting signature cells and T cell or NK signature uh, cells. So um, this has uh, now been published, and there's a number of other uh, similar signatures that are now in process. Um, most significantly, we'll see a few of them uh, at the World Lung Cancer Congress in, in Tokyo in a few weeks, but I can't present those to you now. But I think it's a space that you should keep your eye on since it's a way that pathologists can still do in their lab. The other platform was alluded to by uh, Dr. Diaz in his talk and has been work that we've been doing in our lab. And it was fact in, first described in some of the earliest papers uh, where Dr. Uh, Tume and his colleagues showed that patients with high CD8 
were more likely to respond than patients with low levels of CD8. And this makes sense. This is sort of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes we've all seen. The categories of tumor types identified by Li Ping Chen in some early work on melanoma, where he sort of put them in four categories. That is, no TILs and no PDL1, high PDL1 and high TILs, no PDL1 but high TILs, and then high PDL1 and low TILs. And you can see the rough percentages here. And what we've been doing is trying to put these into categories that we can actually look at activation of these T cells. That is, instead of just asking, can we look at how many T cells are present, can we ask if the T cells are present, are they activated? And the way we did this is if they're not present, uh, that is, they're TIL negative, well, then they're going to be in this category we just call CD3 low or TIL low. If they're present, then there's two possibilities. They could either be high granzyme and high key 67, which would be activated, um, or they could be uh, neither high granzyme nor key 67, and those would be dormant T cells. And so with those three types, we could actually ask the question of can we assess T cell activation as a future method to predict response to therapy. And you can see that in this cohort, of, a relatively small cohort of lung cancer patients in a retrospective study, there's a broad range of expression of these different markers, and that neither granzyme or key 67 by themselves predict clinical benefit, although CD3 does, in fact, click, predict clinical benefit by itself. But when you combine them uh, for progression-free survival and especially overall survival, you can see it's the type 2s. It's the dormant ones that benefit most, which actually at first we didn't think would be true, but then on further consideration we thought, wait a sec, those are the ones that are checked. So if you inhibit the checkpoint, then those are the ones that are most likely to be capable of actually responding to this therapy, and you can see that for progression-free and overall survival. This was a pilot study presented last year at the World Lung Confer Conference by Dr. Kurt Schalper and his team, uh, and Scott Gettinger et al. Uh, Scott is the first author as an oncologist, and this work is now under revision, not published yet. But we were very interested in this, so we looked at it in melanoma, and here's the same markers in melanoma to see if something crosses tumor types, perhaps it's more convincing. And you can see high CD3, uh, certainly uh, by two different uh, quantitative software measurements, seems to be predictive to response, but not so much for the others. But when you combine them, in fact, you can see, and this is early studies using both cell counts and using quantitative software, that again, it's group two that does the best, uh, whereas group one and group three do less well uh, in this context. And then the last thing I want to discuss in the last couple minutes is capacity to express PDL1, whether this will be done by, um, uh, what assays this will be done by remains to be seen. This was the issue that was addressed is that in the same piece of tumor, you can have both PDL1 negative and PDL1 positive case uh, regions of the tumor. And in fact, um, given that, maybe we should look at how PDL1 is expressed or how it's controlled. And in fact, um, there's a number of different transcription factors, NF-kappa B and IRF1, and even some microRNAs that control the expression of PDL1 mRNA. And so the thought was that if we can look at how it's expressed, perhaps that could be a biomarker. And in fact, that was found to be the case that patients that had high IRF1, this is a small melanoma cohort done by Smithy et al., um, showed that there is actually um, a relationship between response and non-response or IRF1 shown here with uh, overall survival compared to PDL1 in this small melanoma cohort. And in fact, uh, validated in a somewhat larger cohort. Um, however, that effect was not a prognostic marker. That is, if you just looked at IRF1 retrospectively, that doesn't actually predict good outcome in melanoma. You have to, you only see that effect when the patients have been treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And in fact, this is a test that has the potential to be converted to a DAB test. This is a DAB staining of IRF1 and PDL1 in the same area. You can see that, in fact, there may be cases that are high in IRF1 that suggest the tumor has the capacity to express PDL1, but hasn't done so yet. This is uh, an example of NF kappa B, and other people are looking at NFAP and other markers as well. So this is sort of another sort of test that you might look out for. You might imagine someday that a transcription factor or a modulator signature in the same way that we saw the signatures constructed uh, on the nanostring platform. And so with that, uh, thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, I hope uh, to see you all again, and hope we answered some of your questions tonight. Thank you. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI.
Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash HGJ. This activity is supported through independent educational grants from AstraZeneca and Bristol Myers Squibb.